Hello, everyone. Welcome to the George Washington University School of Public Health Bioethics Interest Group. We have a great discussion for you today. Uh, we have Dr. Alex John London here uh, with training in philosophy. Um, uh, Alex, um, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself briefly in a minute. And Dr. Cheng Zing, uh, who is a computer scientist. And um, we're going to discuss the ethics of artificial intelligence in the biomedical arena. I'm going to serve as your moderator. I'm basically functioning as the person to help solicit the, the, the brilliance of our two panelists and um, unveil the brilliance of our two panelists and um, to moderate questions. Um, each panelist will speak for 10 to 15 minutes and then we will have a vibrant Q&A session. What we would love for you to do is to put your questions into the chat. And then we, uh, our team is also going to help us um, organize the questions and um, let us know who has asked questions and who uh, would like to ask questions. So um, we're going to hear from Dr. Alex John London first, and then Dr. Ching Zing. And with each of you at the beginning of your talks, really just introduce yourselves briefly and really your experience in this AI space, which obviously is um, somewhat new, but not all that new, right? It is evolving. It is much more in the public's perception now, especially in the medical arena. So we would just like to show our audience what it's like. Well, we, we will be recording this session and uh, we look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Dr. London. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for having me. Um, and I will share my slides now. Uh, so I'm uh, Alex John London. Uh, I'm professor of philosophy at Carnegie Mellon, where I direct the Center for Ethics and Policy, and I co-direct the um, KNL Gates uh, Initiative in Ethics and Computational Technologies. And I work in bioethics, research ethics, and um, the ethics of AI. And so I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that uh, healthcare poses, uh, you know, individual and public health. So I'm just saying healthcare generally um, uh, to for the development and deployment of AI systems that achieve the goals that we want them to achieve. So let me just start uh, by saying that I don't have any conflicts to disclose regarding material in my talk, and that if I mention a product or an system or an approach, uh, it's it's not an endorsement. So um, in the middle of this uh, diagram is sort of the life cycle of things that you have to get right in order to make an AI system that's going to do what you want it to do. And there's a lot of, of language out there now about sort of general purpose AI systems um, in general, I, I think in the healthcare setting, you have to have a well-defined task that you want your AI system, general purpose or not, to be able to, to um, accomplish. And that task needs to be one that's going to make health systems more effective, more efficient, or more equitable. Because the ultimate goal here is to advance the health needs of patients, whether we're talking about public or individual health. To make a system that will perform such a task, you're gonna to have to have data that's fit for purpose so that you can build a model that will perform that task. And once you've done that, you have to validate your model that it actually performs the task in a way where it's in integrated into a health system that the benefits that you've designed your model to produce actually are realized in, in, in practice. And then you have to be able to deploy that system in a way that achieves those benefits in the real world. And so the talk I'm going to give is drawn from some of the material I've, I've published in this paper in Cell Reports Medicine, and it's just about challenges at each of these stages. Now, I'm not uh, an AI skeptic or an AI enthusiast. Uh, I am committed to the values of improving healthcare for people, closing healthcare gaps, and making health systems more effective, more efficient, and more equitable. That's what I'm committed to. To the extent that AI can do it, I'm for it. To the extent that it re uh, moves pieces around the board and just changes who has which resources but doesn't advance those goals, then I'm again it. All right. So, um, Memories are really short in this space. So if you think about at the top, uh, you know, our, our 
lovely character here in the middle was Watson from uh, IBM that conquered Jeopardy. And at the end of that, they were like, where are you going after you now that you've conquered Jeopardy? And they're like, Watson's going to go and conquer cancer. And everybody was like, yeah, cancer, like you're going to get yours now, right? Like AI is coming for you. Um, this was not a garage, you know, a few people in a garage. This was not a startup. This was a blue chip multinational company that spent $5 billion on acquisitions alone um, that had 7,000 employees working on the Watson project at one point and where the reviews in the literature basically describe it as a total failure from which IBM had to just walk away. So that's a quote, that's not me. Um, and um, why was that? Uh, like they, they just sold, the Watson Health was sold for a uh, billion dollars. Um, and why was it a total failure? Largely, it was because the task that IBM set out to do, replace physicians, have a system that could replace physicians, that could go into the medical literature, synthesize the data, make a diagnosis or a prognosis, and effectively um, you know, fill in for the all the complex roles that physicians uh, carry out. There was little reason to think that the kind of natural language processing system that Watson was could perform that task. Now, you might be like, well, you know, that was 2017. That, you know, that's an age ago in terms of AI. Um, so, you know, the other little diagram here is from Meta's Galactica. And you might be like, oh, I'm not familiar with Galactica. I know like ChatGPT and these other things. And, you know, part of the issue there was that of, unlike the ChatGPT, where they put it out as like, multi-purpose system, right? Where it's not clear exactly what tasks it's gonna be able to do for you reliably. Um, Meta had said, this is something that's going to curate the scientific literature, distill it for you, make it available, summarize it for you. And then they pulled it after um, uh, three days uh, because like these generative models do, it hallucinated or fabricated, right? So it said things that weren't true. And then it could also be uh, prompted in a, uh, to uh, produce toxic language. So the point here is just that there's a real challenge in trying to align AI systems and what they're capable of doing with tasks in healthcare that are going to make the healthcare system more effective and efficient and equitable for patients. And I would say this hurdle is 90% uh, of, of the, you know, of success or failure. The next thing then is making sure that you have data that is fit for purpose. And I've just chosen one example here where, you know, health system data. So, you know, the allegations, the claims are that um, green light uh, that is used by most of these, you know, pulse uh, oximeters doesn't penetrate the skin of darker skin uh, as well as it does lighter skin. And so there are several studies that say these things uh, overestimate oxygen, peripheral oxygenation levels in patients with darker skin. Um, and that would mean then that during an outbreak of something like COVID, where there's a respiratory virus and people need, you know, um, people are in distress and need oxygen replacement, that uh, patients with darker skin would systematically be deprioritized for uh, oxygen because their levels would be um, overestimated. And so what you would have now is the data from these systems and the outcomes of these patients, where outcomes now are mediated by the fact that we're underdiagnosing their care and so not providing adequate care. The data on those outcomes are the data on which we're going to be building new healthcare systems. And so to the extent that we don't realize that what we've done and those data are the things that we condition on when we build new systems, we will be building in the same kind of bias that would result in undertreatment of the same populations um, that who are who are undertreated, underserved very often in healthcare systems as they are. Um, and this is just one type of bias. Um, minoritized populations are underrepresented in our data sets. Um, and the data that we have in the electronic medical records and elsewhere tends to have more toxic language about such, such patient groups. And so you see this with large language models. There was a study recently out of Stanford. You know, we tried to eliminate uh, racial mythologies in our medical education, but, you know, large language models are trained on the internet. And so if you ask them, you know, questions about racial mythology, you know, for instance, do patients with darker skin have a higher tolerance for pain than patients with lighter skin? The large language model is like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that, that sounds right to me. So, you know, part of the issue there is whether the data that we have is fit for purpose. And a lot of the healthcare data that we have is, from the electronic medical record is billing data or clinical treatment data. But in order to answer research questions, very often you need to gather more data with greater granularity 
um, you know, with finer measurements than you do for billing or, or clinical purposes. So the idea that we're going to be able to take the data that's just laying around and advance priority health needs, um, you know, uh, that may be the case in some cases, but it's unlikely to be widespread case. I'm not going to say much about this because it's much more complicated, but the, the point I want to make here is that, you know, um, the tasks that AI can perform now are really sort of uh, classification. So um, being able to say, is this an example of that? So is this lesion, you know, cancerous or not? Like that's a classification problem. Um, and prediction, but prediction is a very specific thing. It basically says if the world stayed the same, and we saw the same dynamic as, you know, so so given the way the world is a patient like this, how much would we spend on their medical care? That's a kind of actuarial predictive question that health insurers are interested in and that we build systems, you know, we can build systems to answer that kind of question. But in medicine, very frequently, what we want to know, especially when we are trying to improve the, the, the provision or health in general, per, per, improve the provision of health services. What we want to know is what would happen if we did something different because we're trying to prevent people from dying. We're trying to prevent bad outcomes. We're trying to prevent, you know, uh, um, uh, toxins for, uh, in the environment, you know, exposures and so on. And so that often involves, well, we'll intervene to try to remediate it. Well, if you're intervening in a way that you've done before and you have a lot of information about what happens, great, then you can predict what will happen. But if you don't have that kind of data because you're intervening in a way that is novel, then uh, using a predictive system to gauge what's going to happen to intervention is now adopting systems to do things they weren't trained to do, and very often with um, uh, a lack of evidence, like a you know, you know, with with assumptions that are not necessarily evidence based. And so some of the material that's been put out about biased healthcare systems are less about bias in the healthcare system and more about people using these systems to do things that they weren't trained or designed to do. So this is partly a feature less of sort of the way these systems function and more about whether health systems can utilize these systems to do the things that they're actually trained to do. And it gets back to, is the task they're actually accomplishing the one that we ultimately want them to accomplish? Uh, testing, you know, so I'm fond of saying the randomized control trial is the slaughter bench of uh, researcher enthusiasm. That's a paraphrase of Hegel, who says history is the slaughter bench of human happiness. You know, nobody spends a billion dollars to bring a drug to a phase three trial and see it fail. But 90% of things that we try in medicine don't work for anything and aren't approved for anything. Uh, so you really have to validate your assumptions because lots of people think lots of things are going to work. And then a well-designed study show that they don't. And there's a large literature about relative low quality of the research that's being produced relative to AI systems. Um, this is just one of them. You know, during COVID, there were literally thousands of, of systems that were designed to diagnose uh, uh, COVID through, using radiographs. And there have been several systematic reviews of those thousands of studies. And by and large, they say, you know, the, the, the most enthusiastic, well, the, the worst says none of them. The most enthusiastic says about a dozen of them. We're now the denominators in thousands, um, you know, uh, were, were of sufficient quality that they could support clinical deployment. Um, so this is a real problem. And then the last thing is, you know, think about how hard it is to maintain your laptop. Think about how hard it is to maintain your printer. Um, now we're talking about maintaining over the long run very complex computational systems. And, um, you know, for for an enterprise, you know, health systems still keep the fax machine running. Uh, the daunting challenge now of being able to maintain these systems and their reliability over time shouldn't be underestimated. And so what I have here is a graph about, you know, the, the, the first appearance of, of uh, COVID-19. And this was the frequency with which sepsis detection systems would alert. And of course, you know, after COVID, these things were just alerting all the time. And it wasn't because we had a proliferation of sepsis. It was because what, of what we call distribution shift, where the properties in the population that correlated with sepsis, uh, right, 
those correlations were were valid because we were training them against what we would see in the population. With the appearance of COVID now, you get a bunch of these properties associated with a new disease that we haven't been able to train the system to sort of uh, you know ignore. And so um, we had to, de you know, hospitals had to decommission those systems. And then you got to figure out, like, what are we doing? Are we retraining our model? You know, are we using some other way to detect sepsis? Because it's not like sepsis goes away. So these are all real challenges. I'm not saying they're insurmountable. I'm just saying don't buy into the idea that we're going to be able to bolt machine learning onto current healthcare systems and then, uh, you know, advance the quality of care relatively, you know, easily and without expense. It's going to require changes in the way we, we provide health services, and it's going to require uh, a lot of additional money. The last thing I want to say is we also have to tackle the problem of making sure that our health systems are prepared in terms of governance. So these tasks are not performed by the same group. This is not a small group that's doing these things, right? Like very often institutional leaders decide what the task should be. Different people gather and curate data from the people who build the model. And the people who do the testing may or may not be the people who do the model. And there's certainly the people who are you know, involved in deployment are unlikely to be the people who have done any of these things. And so as a result, you have to have a system where everybody knows what the relevant obligations are uh, in order to make sure that they can achieve these objectives. Um, and then we've got to have clear norms of accountability that will hold those different people accountable so that this system functions to advance these priority goals. Without that, we're going to be moving pieces around the board. We're going to be um, spending a lot of money on new computational systems and new enterprises, but patients and healthcare systems aren't going to benefit. All right, I'm over my time. So thanks very much for listening. Thanks so much, Dr. London. Um, before we go to Dr. Zeng, I have one quick question for you. On the last slide, where you have the different people that are going to be involved, uh, or that should be involved in moving forward, where do you put ethics? Where would you locate ethics analysis, ethics policy recommendations, ethics in general? You, me, where would we go on that on that slide? So I think uh, the ethics isn't at any particular point in that slide. Ethics is at every point in that slide because every decision at every node has important ethical implications. And so I think this is a this is a longer conversation, but I think there are competing models right now for ethics in this space. One is a kind of centralized model where you wanna have like a, a chief AI officer and then responsible AI and ethical AI is sort of built into that single chief AI officer type position. Um, and so then it's that person's responsibility to make sure that everybody at these different places along the line understands the the way in which their decisions are ethically relevant and then tries to police those things. That's one model. A federated model just says everybody at each of these parts has to understand the ethical obligations that they have. And then there needs to be procedures to make sure that they're articulated on the table and then you know that they've been um, uh, satisfied uh, and that you don't necessarily centralize that in one place because you don't centralize, you know, say the the obligations of everybody to do their mathematics appropriately, you know, or to engineer to safety, right? You know, everybody has these separate obligations and then you might have, what you need then is a system to make sure that people know what their obligations are and are satisfying them. So I, I, I don't like models that say, and then here's where the ethics review happens. If your ethics review happens at the very end, decisions have already been made, the toothpaste is out of the tube, the ship has already sailed, um, and uh, and then you have your technical people bumping up against your ethics and regulatory people, which is not what you want. You want that the ethics and regulatory to be involved from the very beginning so that the decisions that are being made dovetail with important technical, ethical, and um, you know health related considerations so that the cogs mesh all the way through. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was very, very helpful. And I, and I know we, we already have some questions, but we're getting many more coming in. Um, next, we have Dr. Cheng Zeng at uh, George Washington University. Uh, Dr. Zeng, I'll let you introduce yourself briefly, but I, I do want to say that I am a member of Dr. Zeng's team on several, and Dr. Zeng is implementing and living this real world of, of trying to make it happen, right, with people along the way. So um, we're happy to have 
such great panelists today um, to present really a, a full a full picture of what we're looking at here. So Dr. Zing, I'll turn it over to you now. Hi, um, thank you, Melissa. Uh, I have to say working with you is the first time I work with a bioethics person closely and uh, trying to understand from your perspective has been a journey for both of us, right? Because we are, we're working very detailed on the data side. You're working, to me, it seems like initially we're so far apart. <laughs> uh, we say explainable. At least in my understanding of what it is, <laughs> right? Like I have I mean, to. Learn. It took us a while to to start to understand each other, because <laughs> um, initially I think uh, it seems like a lot of lofty ideas, and how do we implement them in real life, in real analysis, in real uh, development? Just briefly, I direct the Biomedical Informatics Center in GW. I also co-direct the Center for Data Science and Outcomes Research at the uh, Washington DC VA Medical Center. My background is in computer science and informatics. We've been working uh, modeling for a long time. And since AI is so popular these days, it didn't just take all of what we do before as AI and everything else we do is also AI now. So, uh, but, but I will, today's talk will be more focused on predictive modeling and bias, which I think is uh, one aspect of the ethical concerns people have. So I'm going to share my slides and go to the presentation mode. Okay, so so I'll focus on uh, the lessons we learned from real world data. These are clinical data, uh, or, or survey data. So we're here because AI has been so successful, uh, and deep neural network as a signature technology. Actually, it didn't just happen in the past decade, but with the tremendous amount of data and uh, uh, nowadays we have such huge computing power, we're in the Watson days they actually still didn't have. Uh, it's making a dramatic difference. Uh, some area more than others, uh, it has been successful image processing, speech recognition, authentic gameplay. We all know the, you know, the um, Go game, people used to think that's definitely the domain of human, but lo and behold, uh, we got the computer beating the world champion hands down. Now, no one even question computer has the ability to be the world champion anymore. Uh, more recently, the chat GPT has everybody talking, everybody excited. It, the performance is indeed, especially with the GPT-4, it has been very stunning. Uh, okay, let me go to the next slide. So biomedical data is harder. Uh, you know, it's a high stake game because uh, with chess and go, it's great and Jeopardy is great. But when human life is at stake, uh, we definitely need to be more careful. And we do have a lot of challenges because certain things are designed by human, like these games. Uh, we don't really have the rules and design of human body worked out. Uh, it's, so we have highly complex data, lots of missing data, unobserved data, irregular time interval. Uh, there's a tremendous need to interpret results. And uh, also because it's hard to, because we don't know the mechanism, uh, so we, it's not easy to generate synthetic data. Uh, so we have a lot of challenges when it comes to numerical, uh, the bio, biomedical data. And uh, so this is a slide from the VA perspective, Veteran Affairs. Uh, it mentioned some aspects of the ethics and relating to AI. So in our group actually, we worked a lot on explainable AI, which I won't talk about, but also on fairness and uh, uh, equitable uh, in the AI models, which I will focus on today. Um, so we hear about AI fairness. So people, for people like me who are actively doing modeling work, uh, we need to know how to measure fairness. What does fairness mean, right? So some of the, the measures 
uh, include a parity between groups accuracy in terms of AUC, which is discri discriminating power, uh, accuracy, true positive, false positive rates. Uh, some studies actually, there's a, it's almost a new genre now. People just measure it and say, ha ha, this model did worse on group A than group B. That's unfair. Uh, other studies developed uh, mitigation methods, uh, including generating and uh, adding synthetic data to an existing data sets. Uh, however, since all of this is new, uh, there's room for improvement. I'll show you three um, studies with real data uh, to stimulate some of our discussion. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about group disparity. So in this case, let's just define it as a given model on a disadvantaged uh, subgroup is comparable to that of another group or the general population that's considered to be parity. And uh, however, this is flawed discussion uh, definition. Uh, we don't know the prevalence. We don't know uh, the magnitude. We don't know the statistical significance. And there's the entire question, does it have to be statistically significant to be called disparity, right? Uh, because you, if you only use one model at a time, maybe just uh, one model, one instance is considered disparity. And also, we don't really know what strategies are effective in reducing group parity on smaller subgroups. Um, so the first study we looked at COVID, I think uh, it was previously mentioned about COVID. Interestingly, the last time I looked, there has been over 60,000 papers published on COVID, and these are in the PubMed uh, repository. Uh, so this samples data set we used is COVID test results in children. This is from the NHIS data. It's a national survey. Um, you can see even in children, we have a large number, I mean, relatively large number. It's uh, close to um, 100,000. Uh, well, sorry, 10, uh, yeah. So this is 9,000, so close to 10,000 uh, individuals. Um, so, so what's interesting about this data set is it's definitely when we work with EHR data, we have easily 10, 20, sometimes 100 times more data than this. But this data is great because we have a lot of uh, social determinants of health that help us identify the groups, subgroups of interest. Uh, so I'm just going to jump over how we did a study uh, directly to the results. So you can see some disparity. Um, so we picked uh, three small groups. We trained, uh, you can see 60 models, right? So if we define disparity just as difference, you can see uh, many models, half of the models can be considered to have some disparity in some ways. And uh, in generally, you can see there's a wide range of difference. So we say, well, you know, model A does better on this population, model B does better on that population. Uh, so we did a statistical testing to say, do we see consistent disparity, worse performance with some subgroups? And we did, we found four of those, non-citizen, good health, black and Native American, in this case, Good health is actually not so great because the vast majority of children have excellent or very good health. And then we tried these uh, two methods to improve the parity. Uh, the short answer is the two techniques we tried work sometimes. Uh, they don't consistently work. Um, so that's another interesting thing. And uh, the second example I want to show you, this is about uh, uh, predicting teenagers' uh, hospitalization in teenagers. And these are rare events, actually. And uh, so we also fitted a bunch of models. We used two techniques. One is downsampling, one is smart to balance the data. Uh, so here's just a summary of the data. You can see, it because this is Cerner EHR data, you see we have so many more patients, right? Uh, it's getting closer to a million. 
this is necessary to look at certain smaller racial groups. Uh, so the biggest group is white, the second is black, the third is Asian. Uh, well, actually the third is other races, but the, the non-other group, uh, the third would be Asian. And uh, so, so here I want to show you a little bit interesting data as well. So we see the AUC, we see the uh, uh, on different models. And uh, one thing I want to mention is these are using two different methods to, to uh, correct the imbalance. So one thing we notice is on this sample size, on this sample, all the models does better on black than on white. And the worst is actually on um, Asian. And uh, so, and the other is in between, but it's other since it's such a mixture of people, maybe it's uh, it's harder to to interpret. So, so this suggests it's not just a sample size game, right? So, so it's uh, sometimes when we talk about the bias and the disparity and people immediately say, well, you need to oversample minorities. But in this case, you can see some minority does better on a certain for a given modeling task than others. So it's not just a matter of oversampling. So we then said, okay, the disparity, well, is it a matter of you, we are not training a model specifically for a group? So this is on the group specific models. So Black still does better than Asian, but interestingly is when we just train a group specific model, in all instances, they do less well than the general model. So this is another challenge for us. So in the group specific model, there is no overt discrimination against one group. I say overt, of course, there's a lot of other things going on. Like we, we for example, we have a CDC project, we're looking at the bias in missing data. It could be introduced in other ways, but it still poses a challenge for us, right? So let's assume we just train a Asian specific model. We still are not doing well. Uh, should we consider that as a disparity? So the last example I want to show you is heart failure among Asian subpopulations. So cardiovascular disease is the second leading cause for Asian Americans, a major uh, risk factor for heart failure. Heart failure is actually the leading cause for hospitalization and mortality. So previously, a lot of data is used as aggregated and uh, but Asian is the fastest increasing minority in this country. And uh, there's uh, conflicting information about heart failure rates rates in AA in general, but also there's just a general lacking of data in the incidence and prevalence of heart failure. So we curated data. This is even larger data set. You can see we started off in the uh, prevalence study, started off 25 million down to 6 million. And from the incidence side, we drilled down to about 4 million patients. So that's a lot of data. Uh, having said that, we most of the data is not uh, fine-grained enough to allow us to identify the subgroup of Asians, but there are still, because it's such a humongous data set, we have enough people to look at East, South, Southeast, uh, these three groups, and also the Asian with unknown ethnicity. So here, the interesting thing is people who does heart failure in this country generally know that uh, there's a big black and white difference. But what new information we want to highlight here is actually the difference between Southeast Asia and East Asia is sometimes larger, sometimes just as large as the black and white difference. This brings up the question, is it fair to report Asian as a general group. Are we overlooking some group like Southeast Asian who clearly is not faring as well? And so this is the uh, uh, prevalence. So you can see there's still the similar 
uh, pattern persist. So, however, uh, the picture changes when we started to predict who's going to get heart failure. So in here you see, very surprisingly, uh, black, which has the second largest uh, sample size is doing the worst in our predictive model versus Asian, who's certainly a very small group comparing to black and white, is doing the best in AUC. So what does that tell you? How can we correct it? Uh, these are all questions, uh, both computational and I guess ethical questions for us to address. So I'll end here and uh, we can discuss this if uh, there's more specific questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Zhang. As, uh, as usual, you give me a lot of things to think about and wonder about. And um, I'm going to give Dr. London actually the first prerogative to see if you have particular questions for Dr. Zhang uh, and vice versa, right? Um, as as uh, presumably you two have never met before. So it could give you uh, the opportunity to question each other. And then you can see we already have a bunch of questions in the chat. And uh, if others in our audience currently of 99 people would uh, like to put other questions into the chat, please do. And we will try to address as many as possible. Uh, so I, I guess one question uh, for Dr. Zhang. Uh, so the area area under the curve is kind of an interesting metric. And um, I've read people say it's not that relevant as a metric in healthcare because very often we don't care about the whole area. Uh, we care about like how a test performs at a very specific point in the relationship between two negatives and uh, you know and uh, false negatives, false positives, for instance, and so looking at the curves in in the diagram that you showed um, at various points, um, you know the uh, uh, you know in, in that grid, they could be very very far apart or or uh, closer, and so um, like for instance, is, would it be possible then that? Uh, there's a point in that uh, uh, space where uh, even though the area under the curve is worse for one population for a test, um, the test does very well for that population at the point that we we might really care about, right? Um, so, so how should we, I guess my question here is something like, it, it, you know, how, how should we, given that very often when we have a test, we only would use it or care about like a very specific um, trade-off between, you know, uh, false negatives and false positives. Should we care about the whole area? What should we do with this metric? Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. So uh, generally, we want to report AUC because it is probably the most uh, objective measure of the overall uh, quality of the model, right? And when you implement a model, one chooses, one could choose depending on the use case. There are use cases we want to optimize for a sensitivity, other use cases, specificity is important. And I think a lot of times the issue is, uh, should we choose a uh, one threshold for all different populations or we choose different threshold for different subpopulations. But this also brings up the question, based on what, right? Race is clearly an easy one, but on the NHS data, for example, we looked at it, it's not just race, it could be immigration status, could be citizenship, could be I mean, related to that health insurance and so on and so forth, but also brings up the question, oftentimes, for example, for Native American, most data sets just have such a minute amount of data on them. How should we choose it? And also on the Asian example, should you choose one for Asian? Is that too large a, a category bucket? As we have shown, you know, it's also, it's almost equivalent of you combine black and white, you choose a threshold. Is that a good thing? And then we have colleagues who have been advocating, you know what, take race out of the picture. <laughs> and I'm, they, they have good arguments too. So, but then 
for us building the model, choosing the threshold, right? We can have concrete criteria, optimize accuracy, optimize this, optimize that. But if you take certain things out of it, what what are we going with? So that's that's a very tough question for us to work through. Uh, so 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 coming back to you as an ethics person, right? Uh, we understand the general uh, principles sometimes, but what we struggle with as people who are building these models, who's evaluating these models is, how do you want us to, to translate this principle into the reality? Um, like, uh, and also using different fairness metrics, we get different results how, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of computational interpretation of fairness uh, metrics for predictive modeling. Um, which one should we use? Because they certainly don't give us the same results. Dr. London, do you want to respond or should I go to the, the long list of questions? But I, I mean, I, I don't really have, I mean, the, 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 I guess the one thing I would say, uh, so choosing your fairness metric, that's, uh, that's an important aspect to justifying the many choices that you just, that you have to make when you're like, here's why I think this tool is going to be effective and equitable. Um, I think the other, the other thing is like, there's so many subpopulations. So for any population, there's an infinite number of ways to divide it into subpopulations. And so there's a real ethical, but also a scientific question about, well, which of those populations should we look at? So you could divide your population too by like, you know, how many vowels do they have in the, in the terms that we use to describe them? And you might be like, well, that doesn't seem like it captures anything or something like that, right? And then it's like, okay, great. So what differentiates that way of carving up a population from, you know, the other ways that we might consider, um, and a lot of this is going to depend on our background theories about the social determinants of health and the degree to which people have access to health care and the degree to which their their biology uh, affects their health care. And so, you know, I think um, even those those are often also empirical assumptions as well. So being clear about like which subpopulations we actually um you know, uh, matter in terms of the analysis and why and what it is that we're looking for is also sort of a scientific but also ethical question. Thank you. Um, thanks to you both. So along these same lines, actually, I have a question from Lauren who um, combines several of the questions of, um, that are among the Q&A. Um, talking about how both of you uh, think about incorporating ethics considerations into design of measurement and evaluation metrics, right? And how, and including what constitutes success? How do you know when you have succeeded? And outcome measures when it comes to AI and machine learning. How will we know when we have succeeded, when we are thinking enough, when we are evaluating enough? Dr. Zhang? Um, I think this is an active area of research. Uh, I don't think anybody has achieved a success. Rather, if you even read the, the New York Times or, or Wall Street Journal or Washington Post, you see it's usually the, the opposite of success that makes the news, right? Uh, we, we've read a lot of examples of not succeeding. And, uh, but, but I think the first step, I think is great is for us to evaluate. So one thing I want to say is many of these uh, issues, most of these issues actually existed for a long, long time with any analysis we do, right? Whether it's data or measurement or whether you use logistic regression or you use uh, deep learning existed for a long time. Uh, but it didn't come to the 
focus until AI became so successful, people are really, everyday people are starting to think we're going to use it for something. So I think that in of itself is a success. And hopefully with more awareness, we should think more deeply. Uh, I think, you know, like Dr. Landon has pointed out, I think uh, ethics, to discuss ethics from the beginning and incorporate it into our uh, selection of the data set into like, like for example, we're doing this explainable AI. Clearly we haven't reached anywhere like complete explanation. We struggle every day to explain what we're doing to even physicians, not to say patients. <laughs> we have a whole project going on about trustworthy AI. Uh, so, so we haven't solved that problem, but I think being aware of it is probably an important first step toward that. Thank you. Um, Dr. London? Yeah, so we've we've done some work on on this question. So we have a paper in patterns uh, that it's open access. You can you can look at. Um, uh, and I think part you know one of the uh, messages from that paper is that we it, 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 the AI unlike anything else in healthcare, people tend to gravitate towards the computational aspect of it. Um, and so like look at how great it works at some. Um, narrow computational task or on some narrow computational metric, whereas uh, which from the standpoint of being a developer, from the standpoint of caring about the technology, perfectly reasonable. From the standpoint of like a patient and the health system and trying to advance the quality of healthcare, um, less important uh, in the sense that um, you've got to be able to design a technology that will then be integrated into a health system and used in a way that makes it more efficient. And so I think there's lots of issues with like you know, we're going to use AI to do diagnosis. And then it's like, let's step back for a second. Is diagnosis the bottleneck? Is it that we're really under diagnosing this condition and we have the capacity to treat it? And if we just diagnose it better, we're going to help more patients? Or is it that we're already diagnosing this condition? Um, and if we if we were to diagnose it even better, um, we don't have the treatment capacity to treat that many uh, that many patients because we're already not treating as many patients as we could. This sort of thing happens a lot in less well-resourced settings um, where the capacity, you're talking about the capacity of the whole system, and then the idea of like, well, our ability to go to a low or middle-income country and diagnose you know, diabetic retinopathy, like think about what that would do for healthcare. And it's like, okay, um, if we increase the degree to which we can diagnose this condition, are these healthcare systems able to now provide the effective care for the people who have been diagnosed? And I think that's this question about you have to have an, a whole system approach to, in that sense, AI is, I, you know, I agree with Dr. Zhang, the same questions come up with every technology. And I think AI exceptionalism is a problem, right? Like, you know, um, there are special problem, you know, issues that arise for AI, but ultimately at the end of the day, for every technology, the standard should be, we should only use it if it makes things better, more efficient or more effective or more equitable. Um, and that's a very end stage, uh, right? Like that is like, th those measurements happen a long way down. So are, we are in the infancy of trying to figure out, you know, how to use AI. And I think people think, oh, look at the success in other areas. AI is really ready to go and revolutionize medicine. And it's like, that's a hope. That's a hope that people have had for decades. And I share the hope. I would love, of course, I would love anything that will revolutionize medicine. Um, but we're in the very early stages of trying to figure this stuff out. And in that sense, I think a lot of the places where we're going to get real bang for our buck are going to be using AI in the... Uh, business parts of medicine, right? The supply chain management, the clerical parts, you know, and that the patient facing part of AI, using AI to do diagnosis, treatment delivery, you know, things like that. Those are incredibly hard problems that we're really still working on. Thank you. Um, along the same lines, uh, at least one of our um, our audience members has has noticed your book in the background, Dr. London, uh, the For the Common Good, and it it segues also to the idea of public health, which Dr. Zhang was talking about with the proliferation of COVID, right, and all of the all of the data that we had during COVID, and particularly in the area of public health. I'm wondering what both of you think that 
AI can do maybe in the near term for public health? Is there a near term? What does near term mean? Um, and, and what about changing how we approach public health? Do you see that actually happening? I, I wouldn't call myself a public health expert in any way, right? Uh, but I think uh, one good thing is, I think it's just like with any technology it could be used for the good, it could be used for the bad. Uh, so, so using COVID example, right? Uh, early on, we had data, actually pretty bad data. So all of the forecasting system have gone wrong and uh, dramatically wrong. <laughs> so it's all keep on playing catch up with, with data. And uh, so, 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 so that's probably not a very good thing, right? So, so that highlights the limitation of what, what any technology, what's the, even the smartest AI can do, right? It, it cannot generate its own data. And in, it doesn't have this innate ability to do that. So, so if we make decisions, and certainly there are public health decisions, we later on now with hindsight is 2020, people start saying, well, maybe one should have done this or that, right? And uh, uh, that's a problem. At the same time, I think AI can do a huge amount of good. So, just take one thing, for example, we have the CDC, this, we have two pilot projects with CDC and the focusing on helping to, this all focus on violence prevention. And uh, so CDC invests tons of money to collect data, right? Despite that huge amount of effort, all the state health department and so on, there's a lot of missing data and, uh, and lots of people's power went to it. So we have recently had very good uh, results using zero-shot learning, large language model-based zero-shot learning in doing automated data extraction. And uh, we can fill in the missing data. We can actually correct some of the inconsistencies because humans are very smart, but uh, very inconsistent. So I think, uh, in that aspect, I think AI can do a huge amount of good. Thank you. Dr. London? Um, so, you know, I, I tend to think of, of AI here as it's, a, it's another method in our statistical toolbox or in our methodological toolbox. And, um, and so in that sense, I, I don't think it's a panacea. Like I, 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 I don't think the idea is that we're gonna be able to take the same data that we have now and sort of spin it into gold, uh, you know, like Rumpelstiltskin in the fairy tale. Like if I just have straw and I, you know, I can sort of spin it into gold. And I think, so in public health in particular, um, investing in your public health infrastructure and having Sentinel, you know, um, you know, being able to test and identify the emergence of new pathogens or, or the spread of existing pathogens, for that, you need to invest in your public health infrastructure and like AI can augment that, um, you know, the desire to move to non-standard data sets in order to try to predict disease outbreak or detect disease outbreaks in a certain sense, like that's great as second best, right? Um, like it's, it's, it's good to use anything you can to do that in a way that would be reliable. Um, but one doesn't want to do that at the expense of the public health infrastructure that we need in order to identify, trace, and then respond to, you know, uh, disease outbreaks. So in that sense, I think I would just come back to the general theme for me, right? Which is, which is like, you know, how would you like it if somebody said, is, is logistic regression going to revolutionize public health, right? To be like, wait a minute, what, what do you mean? That's like a tool that I would use given data that I have. That's sort of my, you know, that, that would be my general response. And so I'd say like, let's make sure that we have a kind of holistic approach to trying to make sure that our, our public health systems are well-funded and functioning well. And then within that, let's see how AI then can, you know, sort of advance the goals of those health systems. I, I, I don't like the idea of, you know, letting health, public health languish and then trying to make up, fill the gap with AI and non-standard data sets. 
Thank you both. Um, as a final question, I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative here. I, I realize I failed to introduce myself. I'm Professor Melissa Goldstein in the Milken Institute School of Public Health at GW. Um, my background is in ethics and law. So my final question is actually to both of you. There's a lot of law going on about the use of AI, a lot of principles, which Dr. London mentioned earlier, but it's not just ethics principles, it's principles of AI governance uh, in this country, in the US, but worldwide as well. Um, and my question kind of is a little bit of an easy one. Is this helping? Is this helping your work? The, the efforts of countries around the world to try to circumscribe this area and point us in whatever those groups are thinking of as the right way, right? Point us in the right direction, prohibit what is harmful, um, punish to a certain extent what is harmful, but like point us in the perhaps explainable, trustworthy is a big word now. It wasn't actually used in this area, you know, five years ago, but it explainable uh, is a new principle that, you know, I was not trained in when I was in, in bioethics. Explainable AI, you know, we weren't thinking about then. So is this helpful to your work or do you see it as more making it more difficult, honestly? Good question. I, I certainly don't know anything about law, but... Uh... But uh, sometimes I'm thinking about law is playing catch up to the imagination of the people, right? So we already see people use generative AI to do some bad things like deep fake or not so deep fake, but they just thought it was true. And uh, uh, on the other hand, maybe, you know, when we're doing synthetic data generation using GAN, it could do something good, right? So instead of calling it a deep fake, People call it digital twin, good thing. So <laughs> I don't know if lawyers, I mean, or lawmakers are even knowing enough to, to come up with a good law yet. Uh, like in our hospital, every hospital in VA now has to have this AI overseeing uh, committee. Mm -hmm. But one of the first thing they do need to know is what is AI doing? So they're coming to us, they say, give a talk on natural language processing, give a talk on this, give a talk on that. So, so it's very, very interesting how these two forces are going. Is the law catching up with the, well, hopefully a good law will prevent the bad things, not hinder us doing good things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. London? Uh, so, I mean, I've been involved in some of those efforts. So with the World Health Organization, there's, uh, you know, I'm part of an expert working group that's put out a report about ethics and governance of, of AI in healthcare. And then we put out another report uh, specifically about um, uh, generative AI and large language models in healthcare, um, where the goal there is to try to provide some guidance about how to understand and apply ethical principles to this new technology. Um, New technologies are disorienting in some ways. You got to figure out well, in what ways are they like old technologies, and in what ways are they different? Um, you know, I think sometimes we lose sight of what is the role that regulation plays, and in particular in medicine, it's a role of one of the fundamental roles for regulation is to fight snake oil. I think the oldest profession in the world is the profession that says, "Take this; it's going to cure whatever it is that ails you." Right, um, and you know. Part of what regulation does is limit access to the market to people who've already proven that what they're trying to sell you works. And I think that that general principle should apply in AI as well, because it's a huge industry with lots of money at stake. And healthcare around the world is a lot of money in the United States. It's already three trillion dollars. Um, and so, you know, having a high bar for proof of efficacy before we get access to, you know, patients and 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 you know, we, and we spend a lot of money on these systems because that money is often shared and scarce as a resource. Um, finding nimble regulatory mechanisms because we don't want to regulate innovation out of existence either. And some of our old approaches are cumbersome and laborious. 
So striking the right deal, uh, you know, the right balance is, you know, uh, is is difficult. And, you know, we're we're going to move ahead. You know, the European Union already has moved ahead with law. We're that far along that there are already laws. Um, um, and so in, improving those is going to be an ongoing process. But I think we absolutely have to improve the the life cycle of AI and being able to distinguish, you know, in the United States, people used to freely write papers that would say like cure for Parkinson's disease or something like that. And then after you read the paper, you'd realize this was a study in rats or mice or something. And then we've, you know, we've, 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 we've mandated that you say like in mice, right? So I think we need this kind of, of um, uh, communication around AI where you're like, this is proof of concept, right? Versus like, this has moved beyond proof of concept now to being something that's in the middle of development versus like we've done pivotal studies of this technology, it's ready to deploy. And so getting consensus in the community about how to demarcate the degree of maturity in these technologies so that stakeholders can be informed when they interact with those technologies would go a long way to improving the development ecosystem here. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I, I know how busy both of you are and for fitting us in and we really, really do appreciate it. Uh, we had a lot of people join us today, uh, a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to answer, but we do have the session recorded. So the questions are there also. So for us all to think about as we move forward here, um, there's a lot for new generations of researchers, uh, ethicists also, please. We want more people to work in this area. I also wanna give a quick plug to the GW Summer Institute um, that you could sign up for at the uh, School of Public Health. Um, and uh, we also have a, another couple of issues that um, our team has put in the chat, um, webinars coming up on um, an RCR seminar series, Responsible Research with Human Research Participants. Um, I do hope that you all will stay engaged. And uh, thank you again so much more to our panelists, Dr. London, Dr. Zhang. I recommend to the entire audience that you follow both of their work in this area as we develop. It's moving. It's moving constantly. In the past two weeks, there have been laws in the EU, right, the WHO, the, um, you know, uh, and the U.S. Um, and, you know, things are moving. Like Dr. Zhang said, there are new requirements for U.S. agencies that are now being required among the agencies, including Dr. Zhang mentioned VA, but that's, you know, it is now part of the law that they have people representing it and thinking about these issues, which is a big difference than one month ago, even. Um, Thank you so much. And we look forward to the next webinar. Uh, it might be in the fall. And uh, thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.